Even many people who call themselves creationists believe in millions of years. But is the evidence for deep time really that rock solid? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, for many people, the age of the Earth is, the age of the universe is a settled issue. Right. The age of the Earth, uh, this number 4.6 billion years is thrown around as, as if it's a fact. And uh, students have gained the, this understanding, they've, they've been taught perhaps, that uh, a couple hundred years ago, scientists started discovering all of this evidence that the Earth is in fact four and a half billion years old, and uh, and that everything that came before it is just uh, it's pre-science. Yeah, type there's of mounds thing. of evidence, etc. That's, That's the idea. Of course, most students aren't taught uh, the history and the presuppositions behind this assumption, so they just accept it. Uh, even many creationists believe that the Earth is millions of years old, right. and that they yeah. actually argue against biological uh, evolution while holding to the concept of geological evolution or millions of years right. um, because of the evidence supposedly. But of course the presuppositions behind the uh, evidence for millions of years are the same presuppositions behind the concept of biological evolution. Yes, so. same types of things. Yeah. Now according to Wikipedia, this is Wikipedia, the primary evidence for the age of the earth comes from radioisotope dating. Right. That's the number one evidence. And we've, we've dealt with this many different times. You can see the links to the shows we've done on the screen. Uh, we've done a couple of shows there, and there's right. others, uh, of course, on creation.com as well. Yeah. So we need to mention that Wikipedia is not like the Encyclopedia <laughs> Britannica or something. Okay, this is a user-edited encyclopedia. Right. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it, it's probably one of the first places that people go to nowadays to get information on things. Right. So, yeah. Um, popular. Yeah, interesting to see on their article that the first thing they mention is the art, this article is about the scientific age for the earth and uh, for religious beliefs, see dating creation, right? That the typical uh, evolution is science and creation is religious type yes, nonsense yes. that we've dealt with so often on the show. But of course, if you look up a definition of, uh, of religion on uh, dictionary.com, for example, you'll see a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered uh, as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies. If you take away the creator part, which is what secularists want to do, it basically says a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. So guess what? Everybody has a religious belief, because even atheists uh, believe uh, they know what the cause and, and uh, Etc. of the universe. Sure, yeah, everybody's yeah. equally religious. Yeah. Now, although Wikipedia, the Wikipedia article touts uh, radioisotope dating as really the, their big guns as, as, for the, as far as the evidence for uh, millions of years, billions of years is concerned, the fact is that 200 years ago, when scientists started looking at, uh, you know, pondering the age of the Earth and, and, and serious, radioisotope dating didn't exist. Right. It wasn't, wasn't around 200 years ago. Uh, the argument back then that was used was very, very different, of course. And there were two major views used to argue then with subsets of belief within those two views. Right. There, there were the gradualists like Charles Lyell, for example. These men were arguing for gradual processes to account for what they saw in geology. Right. And then uh, the flip side were catastrophists like George Cuvier and William Buckland. And these were more likely to believe in sudden events or catastrophes to explain much of what they saw in the rocks. And, and, and note, by the way, that not all catastrophists uh, believed in a young earth. Many were catastrophists that believed in old earth, but saw cat catastrophes as, as a way to explain things. Right. Now note something here. Both were looking at exactly the same data. Right. They're looking at the rocks and so on. Um, here we see again the difference between operational and historical science, that it seems like we do this to death, and, and, but people still don't get it. There's right. differences in this area. Yep. No one can go back in time and see these geological features form. Right. So we're talking about things that are not observed. Um, and, and then you interpret those facts based on what history you believe to be true. That's right. So they're both looking at the same facts. They're both coming to completely different conclusions. Right. And oftentimes they still both believe in millions of years that they're coming to different conclusions, <laughs> et cetera. So 
back then there were three main evidences used to, uh, that the gradualists, uh, old earth advocates, used to bolster their beliefs in an old earth, millions of years process. Okay. They were the time needed to erode valley, valleys, two, volcanism, uh, volcanoes, and three, the time needed to form sedimentary rocks. We've already shown the, the serious problems with radiometric dating and things like that. What we want to do on this show is go back to the beginning of this concept of millions of years, the popular notion of millions of years, and, and see how uh, those arguments that they used back then stack up uh, based on what we know today about science. Over three chapters, the book of Genesis vividly describes a worldwide flood that began with all the fountains of the great deep bursting forth and the floodgates of heaven being opened. The reality of Noah's flood is the crux of the conflict between evolutionary and biblical worldviews. If this global deluge really happened, then the millions of years of earth history and evolutionary progression supposedly seen in the fossil record are swept away. The flood accounts for the major geological features and the vast majority of the fossil record. Indeed, the fossils themselves are a mute testimony to the truth of the flood. We find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Just what you would expect from the biblical account. If Christians were to believe and effectively defend the biblical account of the flood, then the basis for the evolutionary worldview would largely collapse. Many people would be saved from such a great pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So if you're just tuned in, uh, today we're talking about is the evidence for deep time really that solid? Right, yeah, so argument one used by old earth uh, geologists in the 17 and 1800s was the time needed to erode valleys. Gradualists were arguing for slow erosion over long periods, obviously, similar to how it, it, it's actually still used to explain Grand Canyon, that the Colorado River slowly carved the right. canyon. Catastrophists, on the other hand, were arguing for events like mega tsunamis to explain the valleys happening quickly. Now, both schools failed to provide a comprehensive explanation because there was not one causal mechanism for valleys. Right. Uh, Dr. M.J.S. Ruddick, uh, one of the foremost historians of geology, describes the problem this way. A case that belonged more specifically to physical geology was the vexed question of the causal origin of valleys. Valleys were observed to be of many forms. A few could plausibly be attributed to the erosion by streams that flowed in them, but most could not. Right. Uh, geologists noticed that there was a tremendous variation in size, configuration, the elevation, uh, different settings for, for valleys, but a specific problem uh, was the difference between U-shaped valleys and V-shaped valleys. Right. Uh, there was a gradual explanation for V-shaped valleys, but not for U-shaped ones. Now, by 1850, glacial erosion was widely accepted as the mechanism for U-shaped uh, valley erosion. And, uh, of course, this would take place over many years, but not necessarily over millions of years. However, the paradigm of gradualism had been uh, so thoroughly integrated into geology by this time that the idea of one unique ice age, which is what creationists would believe, of course, right. was changed to be uh, simply one of many uh, ice ages, probably caused by global ch climate change over millions and millions of years. Yeah, the main argument from the gradualists included uh, the rate of erosion seen in modern streams. You look at a stream and they saw how fast it eroded and that was their argument. Since most streams are much smaller than the, than the valleys you find them in, uh, an assumption of constant rates demanded a long time. Right. And that's where you get the, the long ages. But of course, energetic currents erode more quickly as modern examples of flooding have shown. For example, uh, Burlingham, Burlingham Canyon in Walla Walla, Washington is a small scale anal analogy, or can be used as an, anal an analogy, yep. uh, to Grand Canyon, which was observed, this canyon was observed to have formed in less than six days. Right. It measures 450 meters long, up to 35 meters deep, and again as wide, winding through a hillside. And in March 1992, of course, Mount St. Helens, there was a mud flow there, uh, that car pyroclastic flow that carved the canyon called Little Grand Canyon. Right. And, uh, and uh, it was what was a mud flow, actually. It was carved in a single day. So if you have higher flows, they can erode canyons there quite clearly. Right, it doesn't so, take time. It takes, yeah. yeah. Another uh, uh, old 
uh, age proof was uh, Jean-Louis Soulevy's estimate of thousands of years to round pebbles. And, uh, and of course, the inference that the rest of the valley features, well, that would have taken far longer than, than even that. Of course, this is falsified by observations at the island Surtsey. Yes. We've talked about yeah. this before. Uh, formed in 1963. By 1965, National Geographic was saying things like this. Boulders on Iceland's Surtsey Island may look old, but they're actually as young as the island itself, which was born after volcanic eruptions on November 14, 1963. Of course, so, two years old, and it had rounded boulders on the shore. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, you, you can just get a stone tumbling machine that can, can do that. They'll right. take precious stones and put it in, and they've rounded out and, and stuff. So, Yeah, a good maximum to remember is either it takes a little water over uh, a little water in a long time or a lot of water in a short time. Right. It's one or the other, but we've seen canyons and valleys. Uh, we've seen canyons and valleys erode slowly with just a little water. But whenever scientific observations are made, it's always a lot of water in a short time. Right. We That's haven't what seen we've it. seen. We haven't seen it the other it, way. Around. We, we haven't seen it the other way around. That's exactly right. Yeah. Richard Van Grad and Kelvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. This week we're talking about the evidence for deep time. Is it really that solid? That's right. what we're talking about. So the second argument that uh, used by old earth geologists, the gradualists uh, in the 1700s and 1800s was volcanism, volcanoes. Right. Uh, 18th century geologists argued that the biblical time scale was untenable because more time was needed to produce volcanoes than the Bible allowed. Uh, of course, the argument was simple. Uh, geologists of the day compared the volume of observed eruptions uh, to the size of, of, of large volcanoes. Because composite uh, volcanoes, they're, they're formed gradually by cooled lava and, and ash that's emitted from them. And so uh, as, as each episode adds more and more mass, the bigger the, the volcano got, the older uh, they assumed it was. Um, okay. uh, for example, Mount Etna uh, reaches uh, 3,350 meters. Um, they estimated the uh, amount of mass ejected from certain volcanoes, and then they divided by how long uh, between the episodes they, they determined uh, there were. Uh, and then they uh, concluded that the volcanoes must be must, much older than the you, biblical times. You time get an scale. age, yeah, right. yeah, that way. Now, um, here, here's a quote. Although the eruptions of Etna and Vesuvius were irregular and notoriously unpredictable, the records did give savants a rough sense of the rate at which those great volcanic cones might have accumulated and hence of their overall age. Now the thing is, observations of modern volcanoes uh, argue against those conclusions, against right. their conclusions. The most common argument for time was based on the scale of flows they observed. Well, a few eruptions from Mount Vesuvius and Mount Etna, that's what they observed. Right. Modern fl eruptions and flows demonstrate great variety in the strength of eruptions and the amount of material produced. A common scale is used to compare the eruptions uh, from, from, these, uh, from these volcanoes. It's the Volcanic Explosivity Index, kind of a cool name. <laughs> yeah. It ranges from zero to eight. It uses ejected volume, chemistry, duration, and the height of the column into the atmosphere. And, and as an example, the uh, 70, 79 AD eruption of Mount Vesuvius rated a five, and the 1815 Mount Tambora eruption a seven. Right, so they rate yep. the, the intensity of these the intensity uh, of it, yeah. episodes. Uh, here's a chart uh, showing what secular scientists have concluded each volcano ejected over an evolutionary time scale. We don't believe these time scales, but anyway, what we observe is that the further in time uh, one goes back, the larger the events uh, were. And of course, this fits the biblical time scale very well, as we would think at the time of the, 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 the great flood, when the fountains of the, the great deep uh, ripped open, the earth plates were moving, there would have been a lot of tectonic activity. Sure. And, uh, yeah. and of course, that would have gradually settled down over time. Um, so there's been plenty of time to, to account for the accumulation of the volcanic mass that, uh, during the biblical time scale. Right. So not only were these uh, geologists wrong about the magnitude of modern eruptions, that's clearly an error, right. uh, but they hadn't studied a sufficient number of historical examples. Right. 
uh, to learn that ancient eruptions were often much larger than, uh, than modern ones. Th this is perfectly consistent with biblical history, as you just said. We yeah. would expect larger eruptions going back into the past. Right. Um, they often considered themselves well-traveled, but well-traveled meant well-traveled in Europe yeah. <laughs> in certain places. Now, uh, the third argument used by uh, older geologists, the gradualists in the 1700s and 1800s, was the time needed to form sedimentary rock. Uh, most geologists in the 1800s accepted a, a standard basic model for, uh, uh, for, the, for the, you know, that day uh, for Earth history and uh, it's summarized here. Geotheories based on falling global sea level were so general that they will be grouped together here and termed the standard model of the Earth's temporal development. So these people uh, believe, that most of them believed in, 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 you know, rising and falling sea levels, explaining the, the rock layers, etc. Most of them were highly opposed to the, the concept of a global flood, because uh, that would have been a catastrophe by this time. Gradualism had taken over sure. pre yeah. Pre yeah. preeminently. Um, and, and so they proposed actually several objections to the, to the biblical flood, and we'll go over them when we get back. Dinosaur fossils are often found in an unusual posture characterised by their head thrown back, hind limbs bent and tails extended. Over the years, scientists have proposed different theories to explain this puzzling phenomenon. However, according to paleontologist Cynthia Marshall Foe, there is only one legitimate explanation, which is that the dinosaurs died of asphyxiation. It is well known that animals starved of oxygen when they die can go into this characteristic posture due to muscle spasms. This this new understanding of dinosaur fossilization fits well with the Bible's account of history, where most dinosaurs were rapidly buried in sediment during the global flood. Starved of oxygen in their last moments, many dinosaurs assumed this unique asphyxiation posture. So the biblical flood provides a simple solution to a long-held dinosaur mystery. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. We're talking today on Creation Magazine Live about evidence for deep time. Is it really that solid? Right. Now, early old earth proponents made a dual argument against a global flood right. in, in geology. And so they argued for millions of years. These are the two things they said against a global flood. They said the sheer volume of sediment, the sedimentary rock, could not possibly have been laid down in a year, the year-long flood. And argument number two, the internal features within those sedimentary rocks, fine layers, for example, a flood could not produce things like that. Those were the two main arguments right. there. These are actually the same two main arguments that are used today they against are. the yeah. global flood. Yeah. So let's tackle the first one first here. Um, to do so, what we're going to do is, one, we're going to determine the total volume of sedimentary rocks in the Earth's crust. Uh, two, determine the surface area over which these rocks were deposited. Uh, then three, we can derive an average thickness of the sedimentary rocks over that area. And then, of course, four, we can compare that estimate to the potential flood depositional rates. How much would the flood have had to accumulate uh, you know, at a time right. to, to yep. let's say per day to do that? So geologists have actually calculated the actual average thickness of the sedimentary rocks on the continents is about 1,800 meters thick. Uh, that means the daily flood average would only be a mere 4.85 meters per day. And so about 16 feet of, 16 of feet sediments per day. Seeing as how we've observed deposition of sediments at rates uh, like this in catastrophic conditions today, yeah, well, yeah. We, we think this is an extremely reasonable proposition. As a matter of fact, secular geologists themselves require deposition rates uh, uh, like this to explain certain data uh, like polystrate trees, trees that go through several layers. For example, Derek Ager, who's uh, an anti-creationist uh, yes, geologist, yeah. admits that slow deposition wouldn't work to explain certain facts that we observe. Uh, for example, he said, if one estimates the total thickness of the British coal measures at about 1,000 meters, laid down in about 10 million years, then assuming a constant rate of sedimentation, it would have taken 100,000 years to bury a tree 10 meters high, which is ridiculous, and we would agree. Yes, obviously, yeah. Now let's take some time and look at the second argument, some of the internal features of the rock, which secular geologists say invalidate the flood. Well, for many decades, geologists believed that, that bedding, especially fine lamination, fine little layers, millimeters thick, for example, required long periods of time in tranquil conditions, like the bottom of a lake or something like that. 
and uh, then these, these layers would build up one or two a year. However, recent research uh, and, and, and field examples show that doesn't always need to be that way. Uh, for example, uh, Guy Berteau uh, in France, he uh, has shown that particles for different particles with different sizes, uh, masses, and densities, they, they, they behave differently in moving water, and they will form fine layers when, when deposited in moving water. Some incredible things there. You can look at more information on that. Go to creation.com slash S-E-D-X-E-X-P, said sedimentation experiments right. is, is where you're going there. He found some amazing things there. Fine layers form quickly. That's right. Yep. Uh, of course, the fine laminated rocks at Mount St. Helens uh, formed a power classic flow from the eruption. Uh, this has shown finely, finely laminated rocks can, can appear in, in hours, right? Yeah, amazing things. Um, the, the, in fact, millimeter uh, thick laminae have been traced for 114 kilometers. For example, the Castile Formation in West Texas. Uh, suggest large-scale, unusual processes, which a global flood would actually explain quite easily. Exactly. Uh, uh, cementation and uh, fossilization, those are processes claimed to require long periods of time, right. uh, much more than a flood year, for example. But uh, these processes can occur rapidly under the right conditions, which are lots of water and lots of minerals. And, uh, for example, the fossilization of a, of a miner's hat, uh, a felt hat found in a mine in Tasmania. It had been covered in water uh, for, for just a little more than 50 years, and it's uh, rock solid. So it doesn't take that long to make a, 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 a fossil yeah, or, or say, a it, cementation. It, it evolved from a soft hat to a hard hat. That's but, right. Uh, yeah. A common joke among CMI speakers. <laughs> stalactites and stalagmites, right? You go into a cave tour today and all these things take a very long period of time. Right. That's, the, that's what's commonly thought. But uh, some of these stalactites and stalagmites, near 10 feet tall, four or five inches in diameter, have been seen to grow in just 20 years. Sizable stalagmites and stalactites. That's right. So, amazing. Numerous minerals act as cement in the rock uh, the rock record. When the chemical environment meets certain parameters, the cements bind to the edges of the grains, often uh, with bonds stronger than the grains themsel themselves. The thing is, cement can make up a significant percentage of a rock body. That's right. Although uh, some geologists claim that cementation is a problem for flood geology, it's actually worse for them. Yes. For example, yeah. a secular geologist, F.J. Uh, Pettijohn, noted, a cemented sandstone stratum, 100 meters thick, for example, contains within it enough cementing material to form a, a layer 25 to 30 meters thick if these minerals weren't segregated. So where did all this cement come from? How is it all evenly distributed and mixed together if, uh, if it wasn't uh, you know, a worldwide flood? So see, the, the thing is, Logic demands that a conclusion be abandoned if its original evidence is unsound. The original evidence for millions of years is completely unsound, yes. and yet today yeah. they use other methods to try to bolster it. Now, um, we've got a book here called Rock Solid Answers, and this answers questions about uh, you know, caves, fossil f uh, preservation, dinosaur tracks, all of these supposed challenges to flood geology. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's just in a fantastic format, great, uh, great uh, format. And if you'd like to order this book to get more information about what we've covered here today, you can just use the code um, uh, CMLRSA, and that'll get you 30% off this book uh, no matter where you're ordering from. So I encourage you to check that out and get more information on the topic we're covering today. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Welcome back. As we wrap things up here, we're talking about deep time and so on. Um, we, we're, now we'll talk about a feedback. Yeah. We often get feedback, people writing into our website and uh, an, uh, asking questions, and sometimes they're not asking questions, but they're uh, making comments, some of which uh, are quite interesting. But uh, here's one uh, from Timothy of the UK. In his letter, he, uh, he, he wrote about Newton 
Isaac Newton, greatest scientist who ever lived, and he's saying, well, Newton was a creationist only because that's the only option that he had. He said this, it does not seem to be an entirely legitimate strategy to claim that scientists such as Newton as creationists and therefore not evolutionists, when in many instances those cited would have been long dead before the rise of evolutionary theory. It is probably indisputable that such, such individuals would have believed the literal truth of biblical creation, but there is obviously no way of knowing whether or not they would have rejected such beliefs in light of Darwinian theory. That's his letter. Right, and so Dr. Jonathan Sarfati comes back um, and, and he said this, uh, here is the line he's, he's talking about, it does not seem to be an entirely legitimate strategy to claim scientists such as New Newton as creationists. And, and Jonathan said, oh yes it is. Common canards of uh, evolutionary zealots are that you can't be real scientists if you uh, are not an evolutionist, and that science is impossible without evolution. That there were people who were by, uh, by definite choice creationists, not just by reason of their social uh, surroundings and milieu, and who were the founders of a significant fields of science gives the lie uh, to these propagands, propaganda claims. I mean, the whole reason why this person wrote in is, that, you know, the common thing is, well, you, you creationists aren't real scientists. And we point out, well, the greatest scientists on the planet were, were creationists. Right. So he's, they're, yep. they're trying to uh, downgrade this, of course. Um, Another point uh, Timothy made here was that, uh, well, evolutionary theory hadn't come up yet by the time of, of Newton. Mm -hmm. And John responds this way. That's Jonathan Sarfati, for yes. those not. <laughs> uh, he says, not so. Evolutionary ideas were not invented by Darwin. Some of the ancient philosophers before Christ, such as Aximander in, in 546, Epidemotus. These people had funny names. <laughs> there's funny names. Empedocius. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of guys here. Demetrius. Uh, who all Epicurious. Lived, Lucretius. Lucretius. Yeah, we can yeah, get that yeah. one. Uh, they had evolutionary ideas that arose that uh, had, had to do with like spontaneous generation and so right. on. More like that. But those were evolutionary ideas that did not involve a creator. Evolutionary ideas were, along, were around long before Darwin. Well, that's the thing. Uh, to be an atheist, you have to believe in evolution. So there have been atheists all throughout our history. And yes. so if you yeah. you're an atheist, how did you get here? Through some form of evolution. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one final point. It's uh, probably indisputable that such individuals would have believed in the literal truth of biblical creation, but there's no, obviously no way of knowing whether or not they would have rejected such beliefs in light of Darwinian theory, and uh, Jonathan said exactly, so we can only cite what they actually believed and leave it up to the evolutionists to assert that they would have changed their minds had they known about Darwin. Awesome. Yeah, Newton good. was a great creationist. You know what? Get your copy of Free Creation Magazine. This is Creation Magazine Live. Calvin and I get a lot of the content for this show from Creation Magazine, the back issues of Creation Magazine. Right. Uh, you can get a free copy. Go to creation.com slash free mag and you can look at a sample copy of Creation Magazine Live. Get yourself signed up for a subscription as well if you like that. And we'll see you next week.